wife. Retired, I might add. Used to be a former part of this congregation many, many years ago. This is good to have you, Pastor. God bless you. One evening this past week, I informed my wife that I would not be sleeping in her bed that night. I felt the urgency in my spirit to go to my office with the burden of this morning's service on my heart. I struggled all night, all night. But early in the morning, I don't know what time, probably about 5 or 5.30, birthed in my spirit somewhere in the, in the world of unconsciousness and semi-consciousness was one word, one word, signs, signs. I can't say I ever had the experience before in my life. The word signs was, 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 was birthed in my spirit. Signs. And I felt that the Lord would have me to share this morning something very relevant. And, 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 and the, the matter of Israel was not even on my agenda. Not even on my agenda. Some material had come across my desk and I had I'd, I'd, I'd not noticed it. And much later in the week it came that this would be the day of prayer for Israel. And while I'm not emphasizing that, uh, I am emphasizing the fact that the Spirit spoke into my heart very clearly. This particular message, this particular word, signs, signs. I want you to turn with me to a number of portions of Scripture this morning. As I preach on the subject, the message of the signs. When I was somewhat younger and lived in the north, I, I enjoyed the early spring season because it was the season when we could hit the high country on our snowmobiles without literally perishing to death. It was a season when we could take off our outer a uh, skidoo suit and just race across uh, open lakes with just the uh, sun beating down and the and the cool cool fresh spring hair just 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 deepening our tan and uh, I must admit after since I'm a little older uh, and since I'm on blood thinners uh, any kind of cool air don't about, don't excite me at all now but I tell you what excites me my wife and I love to, to walk uh, in the evenings or in the early mornings, but mostly in the evenings. The early mornings finds us here at the church. And um, as we've been walking recently, particularly the last three, four weeks, we, we, see, we see things. We, we see the, the geese beginning to pair off into just pairs, male, female. And I would say to a fellow man, look, see this? Pair. We walk a little more, pair. We drive through the field, and there's a pair of geese, a pair of geese. We, we uh, walk, and we see the, 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 the slightest indication of budding on the trees. And, and, and we see just little sprouts of green foliage coming up through the dead leaves of the past fall, and, and I say, look, look, it's warm enough, it's warm enough for, it's warm enough for this to begin to respond. And we, we observe other things, and a little later on, we, we, will, we will see a mother duck with her ducklings uh, just paddling along behind her, and, and, and I realize, I realize this, that summer is coming. These are signs that summer are coming. And summer is a great season for most of us because the truth is not a whole lot of us like winter anymore. I don't see any of you striving to go to the Yukon. No one's looking for work in the Northwest Territories. Nobody is wondering, oh, I'm so sad today because my heart and mind is up at the Arctic Circle. 
And I just love to be there in 95 degrees of below zero and, and a wild driving snowstorm. We're not like that. We love the signs of spring. We love the signs of life. And every sign encourages us after we've had a long winter like we have had here this year. And so it is. Signs give us a message. The message is that summer is coming. The message is that, that there's a vacation time coming. There's a whole different attitude towards work and a whole different uh, sense of the evenings are getting longer. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. And so there's a message behind these signs. I'm here to tell you this morning that this world is full of signs of the coming of Jesus Christ. You would have to be dumb, deaf, and illiterate not to hear them, not to see them, and not to begin to understand them. Because Jesus and the New Testament gives us incredible, incredible incredible, unfailable, totally reliable, 100% dependable signs that when we see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head because Jesus is coming. Amen. It doesn't say get more involved with this world. It doesn't say put your roots down deeper. It says hold on to it lightly because Jesus is coming. Somebody say amen if you believe it. I'm speaking to the church this morning. Somebody say amen if you believe it. Church, don't live like you're going to stay here for a long time because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Don't plan like you're going to stay here for a long time because Jesus is coming. Don't plan for anything that would say summer is not coming because summer is coming. Amen. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Somebody say, it's coming, amen. Jesus is coming. I want this message to stir every heart here in this audience and every heart that's watching me by, by live streaming to understand this truth. Jesus Christ is coming back, amen. And he's coming sooner than later and sooner than most of us think. Listen to what the Word of God says. Listen to what the Word of God says. I'm going to read a number of texts for you. We're going to begin with 16 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted Jesus, desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and is threatening. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky... But can ye not discern the signs of the times? I believe that Christ today would chastise this church if he was on earth. I believe he would chastise the church in general if he was on earth and say, all of these signs are happening around about you, and most of you are living and going on as if nothing is going to happen. Jesus is coming back. Church, Jesus is coming back. Live streaming audience, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Are you ready to meet him? Jesus said to the Pharisees, you who tell about and understand all the things that's going on around about you cannot discern the truth or the fact that the time is upon us when we should be be preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm amongst you, he said, and you have all the signs from your prophets and you miss me. What a condemnation. What a sad, I wonder what he'd say to the church today. When we put so much emphasis on being here for a long time and we neglect this critical truth that Jesus is coming. Very few churches in our fellowship, very few churches in the Christian faith today speak about the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the saints and the return of Jesus Christ. Very few. We're more caught up with how we can be successful. How we can do this, how we can do that, how we can do something else. The truth is, Jesus is saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, because I'm coming back. Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, Jesus chastised the, the folk of his day because of that. Then come with me to Matthew 24. Very classic example, very classic chapter in, in, in New Testament prophecy. Verses 24, chapter 24, verses 1 to 14. Listen to what it says. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. 
But Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Truly I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus now is talking to them about what would happen in about 35 years after his death when the Romans would come and destroy it. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? That's the first question. The second question, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? There's two questions there. They said, Pastor, tell us about this destruction that's coming. Even he was referring to the 70 AD scenario by, by Titus. Uh, and then tell us about the end of the world and your coming at that time. Tell us about those things. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed and that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, shall deceive many. Ah, interesting verse. I used to wonder one time, I'm, this is a parenthesis, this is for free, no charge for this little bit of information. I used to wonder one time about that verse. They would come and they'd say, I am Christ. And, uh, and he told them not to believe them. I thought about that, I am, they said, I am Christ. And I thought that it meant that the person saying that called themselves Christ. That's not true. The truth is, Many would come in Christ's name and would deceive many. Church, you need to know the Word of God. Church, before you buy a tape or before you buy a video or before you invest in somebody's ministry, make sure you understand what they're preaching. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear Pastor so-and-so? Great name. And he's talking about that doesn't make him biblical. There are silver-tongued and golden-mouthed preachers who do not believe the Word of God and who are living like charlatans. Not all, but there are some. In fact, this week I was embarrassed by a breaking news here in this city of a pastor and his wife who had a Ponzi scheme going and robbed literally hundreds of their congregation of something like $38 million. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's sickening. Don't fa talk, fall for everything that is said. Get to know the person who says it. Amen. There's nothing like knowing the hands and the feet of those who serve you and who love you and who care for you. Mm. Many will come and say, Jesus is Christ. And you will go for it. And there's a private and personal agenda. Jesus said, give no heed to these things. They will say, I am Christ and shall deceive many. For many shall come in my name, and ye shall hear of wars, the sixth verse, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is still not yet. We've been in a season of unprecedented war for the past number of decades, beginning with the great war of, 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 the, of the early 1900s, then the Second World War, hundreds of regional wars and, and continental wars. But the end is not yet, it says. You should hear of all these things. But he said they must come to pass, but the end is still not here. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in many places. All those things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. My God, he's speaking to the church today. Because of the abounding iniquity, the love of many shall, uh, shall wax cold. Iniquity gets its dirty hands into the life of the church and into the life of the believer, and it deceives that believer, and they're led astray. God, Jesus said, these are the things, these are the signs uh, that says, uh, uh, that talks about my return. Many false prophets, then many shall be offended but, and, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. 
Many false prophets, the 11th verse, shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I, I took a little look at that word wax. And it means a gradual cooling off until there's no life left. Are you hot or cold this morning? I'm, 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 I'm militant in my spirit. Are you hot or cold? Are you involved with what God is doing? Or are you just sitting back, sopping up everybody else's giftings? Are you saying, oh God, I don't have much to give, but here it is. And I don't have much time to give it, but here I am. I'm investing in the kingdom work of God. Father, here it is. I can't do a whole lot, Lord, but I can pray for those in leadership. I can pray for those on the front lines. I can stand by them with a word of encouragement, not a word of criticism. Mm. Because Jesus is coming. And there's going to be a lot of surprises. The scriptures, he says that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations. And then shall the end come. We are seeing, and I'll elaborate a little bit more maybe on this, but we are seeing an unprecedented reaching of the nations through the work, missions work of the church, no matter what denomination I'm not talking about but the church in general is reaching into every crook and corner and is 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 is, is making a such a powerful impact that the body of Christ is growing by more than a million people per day as people come because of the preaching of the gospel into the knowledge of faith of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior he's getting his bride ready amen he's getting her ready to go home to the father's house for the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's getting her ready. Then shall the end come after the gospel has been preached to all of these nations. Now come with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Take you to verses 25 to 28. The 24th verse deals with the fall of Jerusalem. At the time of the, of the, of the um, uh, 70 A.D., the time of the Gentiles, that time of the Gentiles is about to be completed. And he says, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. You know what that means? Nations without per with perplexity means nations and problems without solutions. That's what it means. The nation is perplexed because they've tried everything and it doesn't work. So they're looking for a solution. You know what the solution is, don't you? One world government, one world uh, uh, currency, and one world leader. And he's ready to be revealed. He is ready to be revealed. If you knew... The shaky ground on which your dollar bill stands, if you knew how uncertain your financial resources are, you would not believe it. You would not believe it. Let me say this to you. If you're investing, the best investment you can make is in the kingdom work of God. If you're treating yourself luxuriously and treating God poorly, I want you to know that your luxurious savings are going to come to naught. Amen. But if you invest in the kingdom work of God and the salvation of souls, I want you to know you're going to reap a harvest, not only now, but into eternity. That's just the way it is, folks. That's God's way of doing things. That's God's way of doing things. And so here in the book of, of Luke chapter 21, he talks about these times and these things. Uh, there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. It refers, it could, it, it, symbolically, it could refer to uh, the, the, the Im almost impossible scenarios that world leaders are dealing with, but it also refers to uh, the physical seas and the waves and the earthquakes and the, and the tornadoes and, the, and we're seeing the tornadoes and we're seeing the floods and all of these sort of things happening at an unprecedented rate, rate and they're telling us that Jesus is coming. 
men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and greater glory, great glory. And when these things begin, look at the word begin, Un underline the word begin, underline the word begin. When these things begin to come to pass, folk, they are coming to pass now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They're coming to pass now. That beginning has begun. That beginning has begun. And the Word of God says when that beginning has begun, we're to look up and lift up our heads for our redemption. Draw it nigh. Someone say amen. If you're looking for the coming of Jesus, say amen. And if you're not looking for the coming of Jesus, you can get saved in this service this morning because I'm going to give you an invitation in a few moments. When these begin, things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Now come with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Paul's second epistle to his student Timothy. Incredible for young pastors and older pastors, and I find my greatest comfort as a pastor in first and second, the books of first and second Timothy, because Paul is talking to us as pastors in Second Timothy chapter three, verses one to five. This know also, Timothy, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Doesn't that sound like today now? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful unholy. If we ever lived in a unholy generation and an unthankful generation, it is this day. When you give somebody, they want more. When, 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 you, when you try to talk about righteousness, they come back with some filth of unrighteousness. It is the day in which we live without natural affection. Men loving men. Women loving women. Folk, I haven't made a whole, whole lot of statement about this, but I'm going to make this now. There's only one definition of marriage. It's found in the Word of God. One man for one woman in a lifetime relationship. And I want you to know that I don't appreciate someone messing around with the definition that God put on marriage. God never intended for one man to marry one woman, one, one, one man to marry one man, one woman to marry one woman. God never intended it. You weren't designed physically, emotionally, or spiritually for it. Amen. You're messing around with God's design. You're messing around with God's design, and there's a price to pay for that. Now you feel like you want to do that as a man with a man and a woman with a woman. You do what you like. I'm not objecting to that. I'm just saying don't call it marriage. Just don't call it marriage. God has already defined marriage, and what God has defined, don't tamper with. Because you do it at your peril. You do it at your peril. You see, they mess around with marriage, with the definition of marriage. One day, a man's going to show up with his goat. He says, I love my goat, and my goat loves me. My goat's waiting for me when I come home in the evening, and I rub her head or his head, and he just responds. I love my goat, and my goat loves me. Where I go, my goat goes. And so, judge, I've come before you today. My goat and I are going to get married. Folk, we don't have a leg to stand on when they mess with the definition of marriage. You can marry your goat, your cow, your camel. Whatever your fancy is, whatever you love, whatever you think loves you, you can marry it. There is an eternal godly judgment for those who tamper with the Word of God. Hear me good, hear me clear, and hear me without any question. God said in His Word the day was coming when there will be unnatural affections. What does that mean? That don't mean, as, as ugly as this seems, that don't mean a man loving someone else's wife. Love for one another is not an unnatural affection. It's a natural affection when we love one another. And it's a perverted love when we 
betray, betray our wife or our husband and go to another woman or man. That's, 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 that's a betrayal of our love. But the scripture said there will come a day when there will be unnatural, against nature. That's what it means. And they've taken the word love and they have brutalized it. And I'm, I don't like it. I don't like it because it's against God's word. And what's against God's word can never be good for you and I. God gave us this book, church. God gave us this book, world. God gave us this book, audience, for our good. For our good. For our good. When parents threw this book out and took on Spock's understanding and books about raising children, the world went into a crisis that she will never recover from. And that's what happens when you replace this book with the foolishness of men and the garbage of men. And Christians invest billions of dollars in buying these silly books and silly tapes and silly whatever it is. Buy the book. Read it. Pray. Give your life to Jesus and you'll raise a normal family. Now there will be rebellion in the hearts of some kids. It was in my heart. There will be rebellion. But mom and dad, when you build your family on the word of God, God will not let you down. They may wander a little bit. They may get confused. They may be subject to the pressures of life. But I tell you, nothing of that can penetrate mama's prayers and daddy's prayers. Amen. Nothing when you build them on a firm foundation. It's the word of God. Amen. It's the word of God. I want it to be known worldwide that this church stands for the word of God. We believe in the old-fashioned word of God. We're not subject to new versions or, or to perversions or anything else that changes the solid word of God. It is the word of God. Amen. The word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Now, I haven't got to the first line of my notes yet. And I don't know when or how this will end. God placed something in my heart the other morning that says signs. That's all he said. Signs, signs, signs. See the signs. Look at the signs. Without natural affection, verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, without natural affections, truce breakers. Truce breakers. Truce breakers. When I stand before God and for before a pastor, and I vow to my spouse uh, that come hell or high water, come good or bad, come calm days or windy days, we are going to stick together. Come sickness, come health problems, come ugliness, come whatever like, we are going to stick together. We make a truce. We make an agreement. I want you to know I come from a generation where a man extended his hand and shook his hand and said, we'll do that, and it was as good as written on paper. Whatever happened to that wholesome, good, old-fashioned biblical truth that a man or a woman ought to be as good as their word? Whatever happened to that? Oh, but circumstances changed. Listen, that's the truth is when you give your word, you give your word. If God wants you out of it, let God get you out of it. If God wants you out of it, let God get you out of it. But stand upon the word of God. Truce breakers. My Lord, now, the simplest transactions needs two lawyers at least and a 15-page document that simply says, I'm going to do it. When I said that to you, that was all I expected. Now someone else has come along with a bigger expectation, so bye-bye. That's not Christian. That's the world's way of doing things. And we're not of this world, church, though we live into it. False accusers. The airways are filled with false accusers. My goodness. They have shows now that are all about falsely accusing one another and who can figure out who's telling the truth. 
Unbelievable. Incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are good. Incontinent means without self-control. Mostly without self-control because self is at the center of our life. You won't have no trouble controlling self when you give self to Jesus. You hear what I'm saying now? You won't have any problems controlling yourself when yourself is committed to the values of the Lord Jesus Christ whom you're supposed to serve. Now, I expect the world to live like this, but the church shouldn't live like this. We should look, be living to be ready to leave at any second. Amen. That's how we should be living. Not entrenched with the garbage of the world or the foolishness of the world. Jesus is speaking to believers and Paul is writing to Timothy. And Timothy said, preach to them as the church that they not get involved with these things that will entrench them in the world. But rather to seek after the things of God. Despises of those that are good. Traitors. Heedy. High-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We're shutting down churches today because those who are supposed to be keeping those churches on have fell in love with the world, and now they are more lovers of pleasure than they are of God. Churches are having to go to means they should never have to go to to raise finances because those who call themselves Christians and part of that church, they don't stand by the word of God, they don't stand by the work of God, and they don't stand by the church of God. Time for us to square our shoulders and say, I'm a believer. And I identify with the body of Christ, and I'm going to stand by the work of God. I'm going to be there in the thick and in the thin. I'm going to be there when there's one amen and when there's 10,000 amens. I am going to be there. I'm not going to sit home and criticize and, 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 and let someone else do the praying and the heavy lifting. Folk, we got a big load to carry. I need every one of you to help lift that load of getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to every man and woman that we can reach for the harvest is ripe and we need to get it reaped before it's too late. I don't need just 40 people. I don't need 50 people. If there's 500 or 600 that call this their church home, I need every one of you. We need every one of you. In fact, the Lord needs every one of you to come alongside, shoulder the burden in prayer, in giving, in encouragement, in standing by the stuff uh, until Jesus comes. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and more importantly, those of us who are involved don't need your criticism. And we don't need your silence. We need your encouragement. Amen. The gift of encouragement, I'm going to preach it sometimes, is, the, is one of the greatest gifts that you have in your possession. The ability to encourage somebody. When a laborer is laboring in the field and someone comes along and says, look, I, I've got a terrible back. I can't get down and, and, and pluck these. But look, I'm thinking about you. Here is a mug of cold water. Many of you can be cold water bringers in a hot day when the body of Christ is laboring in the field to reap the harvest. Instead of sitting back with your arms crossed waiting for next Sunday to come to get your dose of encouragement. I'm just being honest. You can fire me if you like. I see retirement on the horizon. <laughs> but I have no intentions to. So don't misread me. Listen to what it says. Having a form of godliness. Mm. Having a form of godliness. I tell you, folk, my spirit gets stirred when I see folk who don't have the substance because they chose not to devote themselves to the call of God. Having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. He says, from such, turn away. Perilous times. Now I'm going to read the first note of my notes. And it's this simple statement. The church needs to be drawn back to the awareness of the coming of Jesus. 
Let me say it again. I really don't need to say anything else beyond that, but I'm going to. The church needs to be drawn back to an awareness of the coming of Jesus. Because we can become so deeply involved in our own thing that we forget the lateness of the hour. I will challenge you. Go online and listen to the messages of preachers around our city and around our country and around our continent. And precious few will talk about the coming of Jesus. Many of them will tell you how to get rich. And crowds are flocking like geese to a slaughter. Because the truth is that the church is not being awakened to the call of the coming of Jesus Christ. And we need to be awakened. It is, it is possible to become so busy that we forget the conditions around us. Israel. Israel is a prime example. Was no different at the time of the first coming of Christ. She was taken up with her laws. She was taken up with her with all the things that she practiced uh, that she thought God was pleased with, uh, even though God wasn't pleased with it. Through the prophecy, cried out to Israel, "Forget all of your holy days. Forget all of your your rituals, and call unto me." And Jesus came and lived with them for thirty three years, and they crucified him. The church has the potential and is very much like that. They have all the things in place except the most important thing, which is the thing of hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches today. That was the cry of the Spirit. That was the cry of God through John the Baptist, on the, on, through, through John the disciple of Christ on the Isle of Patmos. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying to the church but we can't hear the Spirit today because too many of church leaders in particular have not heard the Spirit of God and the people have become like their leader. And so what happens is that God is no longer heard, but it's the will of man and the ideas of man and this great book and that great book and some other great book. Don't get me wrong, my library is filled with 1,500 great books. But the greatest book is right here. Right there. Right there. And I don't care how popular, how well-loved, or how famous, or how wealthy the author is. If he doesn't write according to this book, he don't get my attention, and he don't get my money. Church, it's wake-up time. I haven't got time to finish all of this, but listen, let me talk to you for a few moments about the signs that I see around us today. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to rush this. I may pick it up again sometime. But you can read it. You all look smart to me. If you will notice, beginning at verse 7. You could probably go back to 6, but 7, we'll pick it up at 7. Down to verse 19. Or 14. Down to verse 14. There are 19 signs that Jesus gives of the day in which we live. Now, you know I can't elaborate on each one of them. I would need a full message to take about three or four. And I do, as I feel the surge in my spirit, plan by the will of God and by the grace of God to in the next number of Sunday mornings to probably focus on on these matters relating to the hour in which we live. But there are 14 or 19 signs of the coming of Jesus in chapter 24, verse 7 to 14. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines and pestilence. War. Our world is at war. 
Our world is at war. The Middle East is in an uproar. And she had been trying to draw Israel into it. And Israel, under restraint, has held back and held back and held back until last night. And Israel did the right thing. If I'd have been in charge, I'd have done it earlier. When I know that my, my enemies who want to obliterate me are getting equipment and, 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 and armaments that can destroy me, I'm going to take care of that. Wouldn't you? But I'm sure there'll be some dumb president and some dumb world leader somewhere that will judge them for what they've done. They were right on. They have been surrounded for, for, for decades by nations who said, we have one intent for you, and that is to destroy you. War, nation against nation, war in Europe, war in, in the Middle East, war in, in Asia. Nation against nation. It could be with a spear and sword, or it could be with an atomic bomb, but it's war. In our world is completely in a chaos. You say, Pastor, don't be so negative. I'm not being negative. That's the most positive thing you could hear. The Bible says when that happens, we're about to get raptured. It depends on what your perspective is. If this is where you want to sit down and make life for the next, next few years, you're probably disappointed. But if you're expecting to walk on streets of gold at about any, at about any minute, you should be excited. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. If, you, if you're expecting to walk on streets of gold, you're, you should be excited. Jesus could come at any time. Plan and plan well, but also plan to leave. Amen. That's the truth, folks. That's the truth. And I'm telling you, if you're living in a lukewarm condition, you're not going to go into rapture. If you are a lukewarm Christian, if you have not been following Christ and you have not been following the word with the word of God, if you are not walking in his way, you are staying right where you are. I don't know where you'll end up in the tribulation. That's somebody else's decision to make. But the lukewarm and the backslider won't wear the marriage crown. Mm. And I'm going to tell you this. Coming to an altar and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry, and go away and that's all to it, don't cut it. Repent and believe and be led by the Spirit. That's the three fundamentals. War. War is everywhere. The second one is famine. I'm just going to walk them through them. I'm going to conclude. Famine. Famine is rampant in our world today. We may not see a lot of it in the Western world, thank God. But listen, across the Asian world and across the African world and across a number of continents, famine is raging where, where children are dying and mama is dying and, and dad is dying and what don't die from famine is being brutalized by war. It's in our world. It's around about us. Watch the news. Some said, but I don't like watching the news. You should. It's a wake-up call for the church to cry out to the Lord. It's a wake-up call to stir passion in our hearts, to stand by our missionaries uh, that's going into those difficult places and, and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Famine, pestilence, from bird flu to SARS to diseases that has no cure, that has no answer from biologists or scientists as to where it comes from, what to do about it. Our world is full of it. In China, as I speak, they're dealing with a SARS type of disease. Don't know where it came from. Got everything quarantined. This week, a number died in one of the Middle Eastern countries from a new disease they'd never seen before. Pharmacies and pharmaceutical companies are, are working overtime and making billions out of it trying to find cures and medicine for new diseases they've never seen before. Jesus said, in the last days before I come, there will be these things happening. Earthquakes, earthquakes. Earthquakes are all over. There's nobody spared from earthquakes anymore. Even this morning I read that, that one, of the, one of the great old earthquakes known for, to man that's found in Alaska is beginning to show its head again. It was on the news this morning earthquakes in many places. Earthquakes. We are surrounded by earthquakes. Folk, that's the language of a loving God saying, wake up. That is not a seismic e eruption. That's the God saying, wake up, wake up. I gave you my word. 
I gave you my word. I told you of the signs that are going to happen. Wake up. The signs are happening. The signs are happening. i got to brush through this. Tribulation. There is tribulation for those who believe in Jesus. We are, we are, if you're reading, if you're reading at all any of the correspondence that we provide for you through Open Doors and other wonderful organizations that stand by us and we stand by them, you will find that the church and families are being persecuted for only one reason, and that is because they say they're believers in Jesus Christ. They can be the most upright family in the community or in the village, and they can be doing the greatest for the village, but because they say, I stand up for Jesus Christ, they are being persecuted. Truth is, and I'm careful when I say this, but maybe a little persecution wouldn't, wouldn't hurt us either. My, my honest conviction is that sometimes the ease we have makes us soft. You're not too excited about that. Persecution, suffering for Christ, saints being hated, all of these, Jesus said, are going are gonna to come in the last days. We're experiencing apostasy, the turning away, the turning away. Millions are turning away from the gospel in the established world, while millions are turning to Jesus Christ in the third world countries. The greatest challenge is facing most of the established denominations is to decide what churches to close and still be able to maintain some sense of service to them. Whereas in the third world, what's happening is that every, every hour a new church is springing up. I talked with one of the superintendents of, 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 of Africa some time ago, and, and I said, how many churches are in your, in your, uh, are in your fellowship? And he said, well, it's 300, but I haven't got the report of the pastors since the last week. Meaning, in the last week, maybe literally dozens of other churches were started as believers turned to Christ. And the greatest need is for leadership in the body of Christ in these worlds. Whereas here, they're laying off pastors. They're, they're, they're combining churches. It's just not happening anymore. Folk, North America is in a spiritual crisis. North America is in a spiritual crisis. And if I had time, I would define that much deeper than the words sound. They're in a spiritual crisis. There's betrayal. There's hatred. There's false prophets. You can, you can call yourself what you like now and proclaim some silly thing, and people will follow you. And they'll write you big checks. And they'll believe you in their will. And they'll all do all that just because you tickle their ears. My goodness, church, have your feet more planted on the word of God than to be caught up with such foolishness. Please, hear what God's word is saying. Deceivers, iniquity abounding. When you think you've heard the very worst thing, you hear something more terrible. And it abounds in the church. The next one is, is, is backsliding. In the 12th verse, call it love that had grown cold. Church, it bothers me. It bothers me. It bothers me deeply. When I see in some people, their greatest goal is to be entertained on Sunday morning. And I got my mind made up. This will not be a house of entertainment. This will be a house of praise. This will be a house of worship. This will be a house of sincerity. This will be a house where young people are stirred to go after the call of God. Where older people are so stirred, they said, man, we can still be involved with the work of God by praying and by going. Where the middle class and the middle age can say, pastor, we're here to serve alongside. And we're here to put our finances behind the work of God. We're into this thing, pastor. We're into this thing. And if you don't like these kinds of messages, you may as well go on because you're going to get a few more of them. God did not call me to tickle the bottom of your feet. 
pat you on the back and tell you you're okay. He called me to preach the truth, amen. And we need to pull up our, our pants and we need to put on our jackets and we need to prepare for spiritual warfare, amen. God called not Gideon's army, he called the simple 300 and not the 33,000, amen. I believe God wants us to rise up. Every one of us has potential in our hands. We have potential in what God has done for us. We have potential in what God has given us. Every one of us pulling in the same direction. No power on earth and no power on hell could ever stop us, amen, because we're pulling in the direction of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. We're pulling in the direction of the Holy Ghost. We're pulling in the direction with the Word of God. God will never betray you when you stand up on His Word. He'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. Folk, if the signs of the time tells us uh, that we are about to see the return of Jesus Christ, this is serious, serious business. But I want you to know something. He says that those who endure unto the end shall be saved. This is not a race for the half-hearted. This is not a race for the uncommitted. This is not a race for the undecided. Well, you know, I'm going to give that a try. I, that, that sounds all right. That will never work. God is calling for you and I to say with determination in our voice and determination in our hearts, I am on board with the Word of God. I'm on board with the call of the Spirit, and I am going to live out my life. No matter what my age is, no matter what my giftings are, I'm going to live out my life, and I'm going to invest my finances, my time, and my words of encouragement into the work of God so that God can use me for His glory and for His honor. I want you to know if you had 800 people with that attitude, nothing will stop the work of God. Nothing will stop the work of God. God needs you. Will you rise up and say, God, I am, I am hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. Will you rise up and say, God, I'm hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. And God, I am surrendering. I am surrendering to you. I'm asking you musicians to come back. I'm going to make an altar call now. If you're here and you're not saved, you've never given your life to Jesus, will you just hurry on up here because we're going to pray with you. And we don't want you to miss it. Jesus is coming. If you're not saved, if you're not saved, will you come and just give your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm surrendering. All to Jesus I surrender. Pastor, can you lead us in that old song or parts of it? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Would you stand, please? I don't want anybody to be sanctuary at all. This is a solemn moment. I want ultimate respect for the Word of God and for the house of God at this moment. Ultimate respect. Stand, please. If you're coming for salvation, get our attention because I'm going to invite this audience to come. I'm going to invite this audience who today have felt in their spirit that the signs we have chatted very lightly about is pointing to the coming of Jesus and you want to be what God wants you to be. I am calling you to make a public declaration that I am going to be what God wants me to be in the home stretch as we prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. The signs are here. How could we miss them? How could we miss them? How could we miss them? The signs are here. This morning you're saying, Pastor, I see the signs. They have been birthed in my spirit. And I'm coming to surrender what God has given me back to him for his glory and for his praise. Uh, God needs every one of you. God needs every one, of, every one of you that declare the name of Jesus in this building as a purpose in the heart of God, as a purpose at this time. Every one of you. Every one of you. How, how, how terrible it is not to know the signs. But how more dreadful it is to know the signs and not heed them. What would you call a man or a woman driving down a road and they come to a sign that says, stop. Road washed out, 400, bank, 400 foot embankment. 
that person just drove it on through heedlessly and lost his or her life. What would you call them? Now, let me, let me take this in here a little moment. What would you say if the Department of Highways didn't put a sign there? That department and government would be, would be fined and, and sued to the ultimate degree, and every one of them would say, proper thing. They should have had a sign there saying, stop. This preacher this morning is putting up a sign and saying, stop. There's danger ahead. There's danger ahead. I do not want the blood of anybody on my hands or the soul of anybody on my hands. You're not saved. You're hitting in the wrong direction. There's an embankment. It's called hell. Hell is still real, folks. It's called a lost eternity. If you're not ready, slip on out right now. Right on. Just slip out right now if you're not ready. If you're here and you're not ready, to be, you're not ready. You're, you're, you're not a Christian. You have not given Jesus Christ your life. You're on a road with a sudden drop-off, and it's called hell. You need to repent. You need to make public confession. We're here to pray with you. We're here to encourage you. This preacher is also speaking to the saved this morning. And I'm inviting everyone this morning who have not been as watchful as you should have been. I'm asking you to come. You have not been as watchful as you should have been. You're saved. You love the Lord, but you've just not been watchful. You've, you've seen the signs, but you let them slip by you. Jesus is coming, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Would you come, please? Would you come? I know the struggle that's going on right now, folks. I know the power that's happening right now in your spirit. There's a struggle in your spirit. You know you haven't been watchful. You know you haven't been diligent. You know that you have not been serving the Lord the way you have. You call him Lord, but you've not been serving him the way you have. There's some things you need to surrender this morning to the Lord. What those things are between you and God, no one's going to ask, no one's going to pry, no one's going to inquire. But there's some things that, that you need to surrender to God so that you can get passionately back in love with Him, passionately working for Him, passionately laboring for Him, passionately supporting the work that He's called us to do. Pastor, lead us. I surrender all. I need to surrender to the Lord this morning for the signs declare He's coming. Amen. Come on, folks. There's a battle going on here. I rebuke the enemy. There's a battle going on here. There's a battle going on here. There's a battle. Father, in the name of Jesus, release those that are bound by a battle of, of, of whatever it might be in their lives. Father, some of your people are bound, and I pray they'll be set free as they surrender those things to them. Lord, those things that are hindering, those things, oh God, set them free right now. My Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, folks. Come on, folks. This is meant to be a transformation moment in your life. Amen. A transfer moment in your life. A transfer moment in your life. Amen. It'll transition you from a lukewarm to someone who's passionately after God's heart. Amen. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Come on, folks. Come on, folks. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan, you're defeated in Jesus' name. Lord, set them free. Lord, set them free. Lord, set them free. Break that lukewarmness. Break that, Lord, that, that complacency in their lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the name of Jesus. That's right. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. You may be involved with ministries. You may be involved with things. You just need to surrender. You may be involved with criticism. You may be involved with condemning. I want you to stand this morning and come to Jesus. Amen. Oh, God. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus.
There's some struggles going on here in the life of some people that call themselves believers. And you are. And you are a believer. It's just that recently you have just become critical of some things. You've become, you're just, there's just some things that Satan has got a stronghold in your life. And it needs to be broken today. Amen. It needs to be broken today. It'll break when you walk up to this altar and let God's people pray.